All right, open your Bibles with me. We're just getting into the Gospel according to St. Matthew. We're ready for chapter 3. If you're trying our class for the very first or second time, we welcome you. Thank you for coming. We would love to have you be with us every Sunday. We invite you to be a part of us every Sunday. We're making our way through the whole Bible uh, for the third time, but this time we're just looking for the highlights of every book. Now, for us Christians, of course, when we get into these Christian scriptures, the 27 scrolls of of our particular contribution to the Bible, uh, we'll spend more time. I intend to spend more time. We won't deal with nearly every verse of every chapter. You may think so as we get started in Matthew's Gospel, just because I think it's so important that we get started off well. But we won't deal with all of Matthew's Gospel, nor any of the others. But I do want to, to remind you again how much they are alike in some ways and how different they are in a few other ways. So that'll be the goal as, as we move along here. Uh, I'll review very quickly what we dealt with last Sunday and then we'll jump right into chapter 3. Let's pray. God, help us know again how important this book is for us that all 66 books are important for us. These 27 we're about to deal with now even more important for us Christians. The great scholars have told us it's okay for us Christians to read the first 39 scrolls asking, is this the God we've come to know in Jesus Christ? And that we will see places where we think the authors were not as closely inspired by you as they might have been when they wandered a little far astray, that we see depicted a God whom we don't see in Jesus Christ. Now we are in the Christian scriptures and we need your special guidance and direction. We want to find those things that are forever true about you and us so that we may faithfully Uh, come to you, be embraced by you, and then move into your world to embrace others in the love that we've experienced. We offer our best in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, quick review for some. And uh, if you missed us last Sunday, uh, maybe something new for you. Three of the Gospels scholars call synoptics because they look alike. This prefix, S-Y-N, we have in synonym, which means named alike, words that, that tend to be almost the same meaning. So in this case, three of them look alike. And if you do any serious reading in biblical studies, most professors will assume you know what that word is and to whom or to what works it is alluding. So they just use it freely. Synoptics, 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 and they always mean Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mark, oldest and briefest of the three, and then Matthew and Luke written after. The reason they look so much alike is that scholars are convinced Matthew and Luke had Mark's gospel in front of them when they wrote. Because there are long paragraphs, in Greek you can see this very clearly, where Matthew and Luke are copying Mark word for word. Why is Mark not copying one of them? Because I told you it is a universal phenomena that when people tell a story and others retell it, the reteller always adds detail. The story gets longer. And in this case, the story gets longer here, briefer here. Furthermore, these two follow the same basic outline of Mark. What Jesus did next, very similar. All three of them have Jesus in Jerusalem just one time as an adult. Luke mentions a time when he was 12 years old. The others don't have that, but they all three have Jesus in Jerusalem just one time, the time he was crucified. John has him there three times as an adult. Different. So the outline here is very much the same. What happened and when did it happen? Matthew and Luke are quite a bit longer than Mark. Part of that comes from the beginning of their Gospels. Mark jumps right in with Jesus as an adult. So does John after a prelude in John. We'll come to that later. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus is an adult right at the beginning of his Gospel. 
Matthew and Luke think more needs to be said. And so each of them has added a genealogy. We looked at the one in Matthew and we simply meant the generations are traced by Matthew best he could from not from Adam and Eve. The Jewish people begin with Abraham and Sarah. And so the genealogy begins with Abraham and Sarah and comes all the way down to Joseph. All right. He also thought it important in trying to point out, we think Matthew is writing primarily to Jews. And if he's writing to Jews and he believes with all his heart that Jesus was the long awaited Messiah of God, and he says right up front he does, he's trying to convince Jews the same. And if that be the case, then Jesus is greater than Moses. I've told you over and over that the three big monotheistic religions differ because of the person in whom they believe God most clearly revealed himself. For Jews, it's Moses, more than any other human being who's ever lived. For Muslims, it's Muhammad the prophet. There's no question about that. And for us Gentile Christians, it's Jesus of Nazareth. And Matthew is trying to build that case right from the very beginning. So what, what Moses did, Jesus will do better in Matthew. Better and bigger every time. So Matthew begins with a genealogy. Jesus, for, for Matthew and Luke, has to be traced back to King David. And so they trace him back to King David. Matthew has this powerful story then about the, the baby Jesus being visited by royalty. Now, he calls them magi, the astrologers, but they came from the east and they were very wealthy. He says they had gold and frankincense and myrrh, which they gave to the infant Jesus at Bethlehem. Luke, we're going to find his gospel is written to the common people. Over and over, he says the common people heard him gladly. Matthew, in his Sermon on the Mount, has Jesus, one of the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. Luke says, blessed are the poor. The poor, the economically poor in Luke. So the orientation is different. So here it's Magi, a giant star. Over here it's an angelic chorus singing to shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Poor people, common people who come trekking into Bethlehem to get a look at the baby. All right? Basic outline the same. Hence, synoptic. The other ways these two differ from Mark is that they have a lot more teaching material. And by that we mean Jesus' teaching. And by that we mean primarily parables. And when Dr. Brandon Scott came to do our Barton Clinton Gordy series, he was trying to convince us, and I think rightly so, he wasn't the first, Dr. Joachim Jeremias was one of the very first scholars, a great German theologian who tried to convince the world that the most authentic thing of Jesus, I mean, that has least interpretation by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the parables. That we're not to pay so much attention to, to the explanation of the parables, because here you're getting that from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Look at the parable. Strip away their interpretation first and see if you can figure out what Jesus might have been saying. Maybe they didn't get it right. Perhaps they didn't get it right, the interpretation part. So uh, the Jesus Seminar people, of which Dr. Brandon Scott was a part, it was an attempt to strip away their interpretations and see if we can get back to what Jesus was saying. And Dr. Scott and others like him, uh, uh, Father Crossan of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, Borg, Marcus Borg of the Lutheran Church, those writers believe that, that we can get back to the, the nugget of truth in each parable. And these writers in the Jesus Seminar believe that all the parables finally were about the kingdom of God. Jesus is trying to to give us a new vision of what it would mean for God's kingdom to come on earth as in heaven. What would that look like? And Dr. Scott's last book was called Reimagining the Kingdom. Reimagining the Kingdom. And after 40 years as an adult scholar, he was trying to put what he finally, you know, 
he's nearly 70 now, what he believed to be the most significant things in those parables. Now, here again, Matthew and Luke, sometimes one will have something the other doesn't have. But there are times when they both tell the same story. Again, in a gospel parallel, you can see this. When you put their story side by side, you can see that they have sometimes three or four sentences, sometimes whole paragraphs. They don't differ a word, which means either one is copying the other or they're both copying something else. And scholars believe they were both copying something else. A written document that we no longer have but was available to them. So since we don't have it, they use a word, quella, which simply means a source. A source that scholars believe was there, but we don't have it. Or it's shortened from the first letter of, of this word to Q. They had Q. And scholars think the closest we have to Q today is the Gospel according to St. Thomas. And the Gospel according to St. Thomas was found in northern Africa in the Coptic branch of Christianity, within the Coptics. But scholars believe the Gospel according to St. Thomas was written back in that first century as well. And it's only teachings. Nothing about being born or dying or crucifixion and resurrection, just teachings. And if some think it might have been that gospel according to, to St. Thomas, perhaps, or something like it. Simply, we don't have the evidence to know exactly. But we are convinced that they had access to some document of just teachings. And sometimes Matthew chose to use one and Luke chose to use another. Sometimes they both use the same story. Uh, and we can see that, that they were both copying from the same document or one from the other. And one reason they think not one from the other, they were written almost in the same time and in quite different locations. And that almost for sure this one's written by a Jew and this one's written by a Gentile. Four Gentiles. This one. Okay. Is all that fairly clear? Again, in the sermon, if you haven't been to church yet, I allude to these kinds of things that I can't go into as much detail in a 25, 28 minute sermon as I can with you. But one of the lections appropriate for today, I'm preaching from Jeremiah, but the gospel lection appropriate for today is read by the Reverend Eva Marie Campbell in the service. And it's about uh, the dinner at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus after Lazarus has been raised from the dead and Martha scurrying around cooking. Uh, Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, even takes some expensive uh, uh, oil of some sort of nard and, and puts it on his head and, and sort of rubs it in, you know, this wonderful expensive oil. The synoptics have that story, but it's not Mary, Martha's sister, who's doing the anointing. Scholars have felt this, the woman here is a woman of ill repute, perhaps, a woman of the streets. Some have said, mm, maybe Mary of Magdala, can't be sure. John says, no, no, it was Martha's sister, Mary, that Mary. The important thing is Martha scurrying around serving, Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, anointing his hair, and Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead, reclines with them at the table. Matthew, Mark, and Luke say Jesus was one time in Jerusalem as an adult after he began his ministry and that he got crucified because he cleansed the temple. That was the straw that broke the camel's back with the temple authorities. When he cleansed the temple, turning tables upside down, lashing out at them with a, 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 a whip, that got him crucified. Not according to John. John wants it very clear that that's not what he believes did it. So he talks about Jesus being in Jerusalem three times, three different Passovers. Hence, we get the idea that maybe his ministry lasted three years. You can't get that from these three. It could have been only one year that he had a ministry. John says three times he was there at Passover. You can, you can count them as you go through his gospel. And the cleansing of the temple doesn't take place the week he got crucified. In John, does here not in John, takes place the first time he came. Because John does not believe that's what got him crucified. He believes he did it. And they didn't like it, but they didn't get upset enough to kill him. 
The reason they plotted to kill him was he raised Lazarus from the dead in John's gospel. That's a difference of opinion, you see. That's why we say gospel according to St. Mark, according to Matthew, according to Luke, according to John. That's the way John sees it. These three, on Thursday night, when Jesus uh, it has the last Passover with his disciples and institutes for us Holy Communion, John doesn't say anything about that at all. He has Jesus take a, a basin of water and wash their feet. So it's different, quite different from these three. So these three, even though they're not the same, call synoptics, this one not. Okay, is that pretty clear to you? Okay, I, I, I think so. Hope, hopefully so, it is. All right, now chapter 3 in Matthew picks up where Mark begins. Matthew's used up a, a fair amount of his writing material already, and he's just now getting to the point where Mark begins. Uh, again, Mark was written first. We're pretty sure about that. Okay, so now he begins with this coming of John the Baptizer. And it literally says in Greek, the Baptizer. In those days, John the Baptizer appeared in the wilderness of Judea. Okay, remember <clears throat> that the word translated wilderness, the area it's describing, for you and me, it would be easier to remember if we simply said desert. Because that's what it is. The desert. Now, those of you who were in Israel with us just two months ago, recall that where we went down to the Jordan to remember our baptism, when it was pouring down rain on us, when we went down there, it was lush, you know, beautiful, green trees, and, and uh, uh, right where the river comes out of the Sea of Galilee. That's where we uh, stopped to celebrate our baptism. Jesus was not baptized there. He was baptized in the desert portion of the Jordan River, and that's down much closer to Jericho. Much closer to Jericho. So it's about 90 miles south of where we dipped our hands into the river. Uh, it, it's on down much closer to Jericho, the desert portion. Now, we also believe that's the case where John was baptizing and Jesus was baptized by him because you remember, Herod the Great's territory had been divided into three parts for his three sons. When Herod the Great died, the three sons took over. And the one who reigned in that southernmost part had his palace uh, and a prison uh, along with it at Machaerus. M-A-C-H-E-R-U-S, Machaerus. And the Machaerus fortress and, and palace were right down near Jericho where John was doing the baptizing. That's where he got arrested, that's where he was put into a cell, and that's where he lost his head, where his head got cut off. Okay, um, so it's in the desert. But notice something else here. Uh, the gospel writers, all of them, are trying to make their readers see that Jesus is the fulfillment of Hebrew Scripture. And so they're looking for places in the scripture. And in Isaiah, we have the words, a voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Um, John the baptizer becomes that voice in the Gospels. Okay? They think Isaiah's words are fulfilled in John. Now, that doesn't mean that Isaiah had to know about John the baptizer. I mean, when he's writing these words 600 years before, you and my understanding of prophecy is that God doesn't put those kind of details into any human being's mind. That what Isaiah did get from the heart of God was hope for his own people, hope for all of God's children, that one day, even in the most deserted of places, a voice will cry out, prepare the way of the Lord. For them, that became, I mean, there was a person down there in the desert doing this. He must be the one talked about in Isaiah. That's the way they saw it. Okay. And his message is repent. Sub in Hebrew, which means, you know now, turn or return. 
return back to the one true God. Return to the one true God who created you. And notice the message. John's message, the gospel writers believe, was fleshed out in Jesus of Nazareth. And that message is, turn again to God because the kingdom of God is at hand. And that all the teachings of Jesus are an attempt to help you and me understand what that kingdom would look like. What does the kingdom look like? We're going to look at some of those parables and see if we can figure it out. Okay? The kingdom of heaven has come near. By the way, in Matthew's gospel, he uses inter... as if there's no difference at all, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. They're one and the same to him. When the kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven, it's the kingdom of God. Okay, so, so he's not just talking about what happens after you die. He's talking about here. This is the one, now here, these are Matthew's words, this brief little quotation that he says are the words of John the baptizer. And then Matthew tells his readers, this is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And you and I know Lord translates, Eye, Asher, Eye, I am who I am. Or as Dr. Brueggemann's going to say next February, Yahweh. I guarantee you, that's what he's going to say in all of his presentations, Yahweh. Hebrew scriptures are his thing. He's going to use that word, that name, many times. That's what he means, the Lord. Make his path straight. Okay. Then it describes John. And the way it describes John is the way a prophet in the Old Testament was described who was as crazy as John, Elijah. Elijah wore this strange clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locust and wild honey. Uh, it's, it's amazing that a story can get out there told by somebody whose credentials are not so good and other people embrace it. For example, this eye, uh, the camel through the eye of the needle. <clears throat> somebody pointed out one time that there's a rock formation and this is the eye of the needle. And so if a camel really gets down on its knees and crawls and so on, it, it could get through Difficult for it to, but it could. And then our better scholars say, no, 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 that's not what Jesus was talking about. He's talking about that little thing that people use to stitch up clothes. That needle. <coughs> the preposterousness of his statement is supposed to be there. This huge, awkward animal with one or two humps on its back to go through the eye of a real needle. That's the point being made. So somebody discovered one time that on the carob tree in Israel, there are beans that grow. And uh, from these beans, they, they make a chocolate-like like substance. And that's what, that's what John was eating. But my professor said, there is no doubt about it. Matthew's talking about bugs. He's talking about bugs. The kind of locust that you see perched on the side of a tree at your house uh, where they come out of that little hardened shell and start over with a new shell and leave that little shell there for you. That kind of bug he ate. Years ago when I was in Houston, uh, I did a late Sunday night radio program uh, called Religion on the Line. And it meant that uh, I was willing to talk about anything, to try to deal with any question that, that callers asked. And it also meant we were on the telephone line. So the people, it was a live show, people could call in, full 90 minutes every Sunday night. I'd preach at First Methodist Church at 7 o'clock, rush Gale and the children out to the parsonage and be sure they were locked in safely for the night. And then I would go to this big 50,000 watt station. KXYZ. It belonged to the ABC network back at that time. And uh, for an hour and a half, I would take live calls on the air, religion on the line. And uh, one time uh, I was told that a priest was in town in Houston, that the bishop had, had asked him to come and pastor a church as an interim while another priest was very ill, battling cancer is my memory that he was going to help out for a brief time, but that he really was from a monastic order 
and uh, he might be an interesting interview. So I contacted him, asked if he would come on, told him what the program was about, and he said he would. So it was very interesting. I could, of course, ask any questions I want to as well. I'm sitting there right across a small table with our headsets and our microphones. I'm looking right at him. And uh, he talked about now the bishop had told him if he would you know, look after this parish until the priest got well or died, that uh, he could go back to doing what he felt called to do, and that was being a monk. But he wanted to establish a new monastery out in the gosh awful wilds of southwest Texas. There are places down there that you, you can, that'll say sometimes, be sure your car's filled with gas, there's not another service station for 125 miles. One of those places, he wanted to build a monastery, and I asked, What are you going to eat? And he said, I'm going to eat locusts like John the Baptist. We will eat bugs. We will eat bugs. Now, just a word about wild honey. Here again, I've always been told that it means bees were not uh, looked after the way we tend to today with hives in people's backyards or their fields. But bees made hives wherever they chose, often in uh, rotted trees where there was a hole they could get into and so on. Our guide this time said, uh, Pilar, I think you heard them, Shirley and Faye, say, uh, well, it's really what we call honey is uh, the juice that comes from dates, the date palm. Uh, and, and she said, I will show you in stores that it's called the honey from dates. And that's what it's more about. Again, my professor said, no, they're talking about wild bees that made hives in the hollows of trees. He ate what was available. That's what John ate. He ate locusts, bugs, wild honey. The people of Jerusalem, now if he's baptizing at the lower end of the Jordan, in the desert part, that's about 17 miles if he's upriver a little way, maybe 20 miles, from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is up a winding road, a very modern new highway now, of course, but in the old days, a winding road up to Jerusalem in the hills. Jordan, River Valley, I've told you about 1,500 feet below sea level, lowest spot on the planet, Jordan River Valley, and then up to about 3,600 feet above sea level in Jerusalem, up in the hills. You ascend more than a mile in a 17-mile trip. Okay. So, people from Jerusalem could come down that road and hear this crazy man. There was something about the message that was drawing large crowds and people were being baptized by him. Now, when it says all Judea, I'm sure it doesn't mean every human being because you and I couldn't get every human being to, to come and see Jesus come back again uh, in Tulsa. We could get a fairly good number for some things and not so many for others. But Matthew's trying to emphasize here that something really significant's taking place. Something really significant's taking place. And something even more significant is about to take place. After John, something even more significant, more significant than Moses as well. So Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, means a river, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, Pilar, I thought this time, did a better job. She was our guide. I thought she did a better job of showing us those baths than, than other guides we'd had. And if you recall, when we got to the house in Jerusalem that, that they think might have been the house of Caiaphas the high priest, there's some evidence that this was the house of Caiaphas the high priest. The first guide we had, Tony, told us unequivocally that this room, this big bulb-shaped room that we would call a cellar almost, was a cell. 
It was a dungeon-like cell. And that it had a little hole up at the top and somebody could be lowered down, put down in there, and they couldn't get out. And that's where they put Jesus as they questioned him. Hoist him up and questioned him, put him back down all night. That's what we were told. Pilar says, that's not right at all. And what she had shown us in other locations, and they're still learning, of course. They are still learning. I couldn't believe how much bigger some of those archaeological digs are in the 14 years since we'd been there last. At Sepphoris. I mean, when we were there 14 years ago, they had just started unearthing Sepphoris. I remember seeing one fairly nice mosaic. We were there 30 minutes. This time we were there nearly three hours. And in a short period of time, you can spend a day at Sepphoris that they have unearthed so many things. And as they have unearthed more and more at Sepphoris and Betchean and other places, they've discovered these baths. And she was pointing out one of the traits of these baths is that being ceremonially clean was so important that as you came out of the bath, you didn't want to touch somebody who hadn't been in yet because he or she would make you ceremonially unclean. So in the way it's designed, there are little steps going down and little steps coming up, and there is a little divider just to show everybody, you don't touch you. You don't get touched by that one. Go in, come out. Go in, come out. And at the house of Caiaphas, that's exactly what it looks like. And so Pilar said, this was a place for a ceremonial bath at Caiaphas' house, not a dungeon cell of some sort. Uh, getting baptized was significant. Becoming ceremonially clean. I, I, what I'm trying to tell you is not only John was doing this. These baths are found everywhere uh, in, in ancient Israel, <coughs> ancient Judea. They were found everywhere. John is doing this in, in the preaching itself. He's begging them to come and hear what he has to say. And then he baptizes those who are ready to turn or be turned, return to their God. Okay. When he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism. Now here again we have two very different groups of people. Pharisees were common people in Jesus' day. You and I might call them the closest thing they had to a middle class they were the hard-working folk, um, not always destitute, not the poorest of the poor, but certainly not the rich. The Sadducees were the rich. The Sadducees were the landowners. Notice how many countries in the Middle East the ruling family are Sunnis and the poor people are Shiites. I don't think President Bush and his advisors really understood the great difference between Sunni and Shiite when we went charging into Iraq. I think they really believed that we would topple Saddam Hussein and his two sons and tell them they could have a democracy and they would all come and vote and live happily ever after. I really think he did. When he declared victory, I thought, I believe, he believed, it was done. But you have to remember that Sunnis and Shiites have been fighting each other over one issue for 20, uh, not 24, 1,400 years. You know what they're fighting over? Who should have succeeded Muhammad the Prophet? When Muhammad the Prophet died, who should have succeeded him? And one group thought one one nephew, and the other group thought the other nephew, and they've been fighting about that for 1,400 years. In Saudi Arabia, a country we really need, the ruling family, Sunnis. The majority, Shiites. Saddam Hussein, in all those years he was head of the Iraqi government, his personal forces those who looked after him, Sunnis, 
the majority of the people, Shiites. Okay. Country after country pretty much holds true. In Jesus' time, the rulers of the temple, the landed folk, Sadducees. The common people, Pharisees. The Sadducees had pretty much everything going for them if they could keep the Romans happy. And so they believed in no life after death. Their motto was, eat, drink, and be merry, tomorrow you die. The Pharisees could see that there are grave injustices in this life. And if God is a God of love, then there must be a time and place when he finally sets things right. They came to believe in resurrection. This discussion Jesus had with one of Lazarus' sisters, do you believe he'll live again? Oh, you mean am I a Sadducee or Pharisee? I'm a Pharisee. I believe he will live again at the last trumpet. Jesus threw her a curve when he said, I am the resurrection. Well, you'll hear that 11 if you haven't been to church yet. Because that's, that's vitally important in the other lection from the gospel that's appropriate for this Sunday before uh, Palm Sunday. Okay, so Sadducees, the ruling parties in Jerusalem and throughout Judea, Pharisees, the common folk. Uh, a Dr. Charlesworth, a United Methodist uh, professor at Princeton for many years, now retired, uh, in one of his writings says that he was convinced in the Jerusalem of Jesus' day he could identify 17 different parties within Judaism. In the last election for representation in the Knesset, there are now 24. But in, if there were 17 in the time of Jesus, 16 of them died. The one that survived? Pharisees. All the Jews in, is, in, in Tulsa are descendants of the Pharisaic movement. Rabbi Charles Sherman, Rabbi Mark Fitzerman would tell you his people, their people, descendants of the Pharisaic movement. The common people of Jesus' time in, in, in Judea. Okay, now what Matthew wants you to understand is everybody's coming to hear John. The rich and the middle or poor, middle class or poor ones are also coming. He saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism. He said to them, you brood of vipers, a nest of snakes that you would see down in the desert. Who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. It's not enough to say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm returning, I'm returning. God wants to see this carried out in the way you live tomorrow. That's what he's saying. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor, and that's enough, just being a descendant of Abraham. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. And guess what? That would be you and I. We are those stones he raised up. The Gentiles, whom Paul would say became children of Abraham because, like Abraham, we trusted that God loves us. Abraham and Sarah trusted God, and it was counted to them as righteousness. We, that was the, an appropriate text just a few weeks ago on Sunday morning. From Genesis, Abraham and Sarah trusted God, and it was counted to them as righteousness, as standing right with God. In next Sunday's lection for Palm Sunday, it's Luke who follows that same line of thought. When Jesus' disciples are hooping and hollering as he rides down the winding little road on the burro, and the Pharisees say, you better tell them to be quiet. And Jesus said, if they are quiet, if I silence them, even the stones will cry out. 
What they're saying is going to be said one way or another. Okay? So, hear this expression about the stones. God is able to raise it. Believe me, down there in desert country, those of you who have been there before, you saw how many rocks there are. Well, you think you're so high and mighty because Abraham and Sarah were your mother and father? Guess what? From all these rocks, God can raise up people who will act in faith with him. So you need to bear fruit worthy of your repentance. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the Gehenna, the city dump at Jerusalem. I baptize you with water for repentance, for turning. But one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Jesus was as big a surprise to John as he was to everybody else. All the left behind books that were made into movies and so on, they still think that's the one that's coming. He's going to ride that stallion this time. And we believe, we mainliners, that they malign so often. No, we think he's going to ride that burro again. You have to make up your mind about that. John was expecting Jesus to kick rear ends and take names. That's not what he did. It's what he thought he was going to do, though. Then Jesus came from Galilee. Now, Galilee, of course, is up around the lake. It's about 90 miles north of there. It doesn't even mention this little nowhere town he came from, Nazareth, not yet. To be baptized by him, by John, at the Jordan. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now. For it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness, right standing. Jesus is going as a person, as a human, as very man of very man. He's going to count on the goodness of God like everybody else does. He's going to trust the goodness of God like everybody else. He's going to bear the fruits worthy of repentance like everybody else. When he said that, John consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him. You notice, it doesn't say everybody saw this or everybody heard this. Mark, Matthew is very specific here. Suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, the Spirit, and a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Okay. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness, means desert again. And those of you who have seen this just recently, eight weeks ago, remember when we left the Jordan River, we followed it along some of the most beautiful farmland in, in all of Israel, right along the Jordan River where they can use it for irrigation purposes. But now we were not allowed to go into Jericho like we were when the Ellises and some others of you, the Smalls, were with us. They were afraid to take us into Jericho. Uh, it's part of the West Bank. It's controlled entirely by Palestinians now. And so... Uh, the guide did the next best thing she could. And they took us up one of the hills. There's a tiny little enclave there with barbed wire uh, almost up to the buses. And the gate opened and we got in and they locked the gate right behind us. There are a couple of Jewish families living there with electrified fence all around them perched upon a hill with Jericho down in the valley below. From Jericho almost to Jerusalem, it's desert. Remember? Desert. Yeah. 
The interesting thing was we had only been there in the summer. Five times we'd been there in the summer. And those hills, you cannot believe how bleak they are this spring. They were green. The grass wasn't waist high, but the hills were green. It had green grass. They were getting rain. I don't know. I mean, every morning when I would pull the draperies back in our room and say to Gail, look at the streets. They're wet. We had never seen wet streets in Israel before. And it was so refreshing to see that they were having a shower almost every night and that things were green. Even down in the desert, that part of it, the grass was green on the hills. Again, not waist deep, but grass nonetheless. It was green. But basically it's a desert. And this wilderness into which Jesus went, uh, he's moving up out of the Jordan River Valley into that desert area. Dr. Brandon Scott preached on this very text, his first presentation in our Barton Gordy series. And he said the word translated devil here literally means in Greek, the liar. He was to be tempted by the liar. And then Dr. Scott said, remember what happened in the Genesis story with Adam and Eve? When God said, there's one tree over here, you don't need to fool around with that tree. If you eat from it, you will die. All the rest of this is good for you. And the snake said, the liar. I can't imagine why God would say that to you. The truth is, if you eat from that tree, you'll be as wise as God and live as long as God. And they had a bite. Remember? So Dr. Scott said that's the word here. To be tempted by the liar. Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. You see that repeated. I mean, go all the way back to Moses. 40 days up on the mountain. That's a significant time. How long is Lent for us? 40 days, you see. These old numbers get carried over uh, century by century. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And afterwards, he was famished. You know that in Islam, when they go through Ramadan, it doesn't mean they don't drink water. It doesn't mean they don't eat. It means they don't eat once the sun comes up until the sun goes down. So Ramadan still follows a lunar pattern. So it backs up, you know, a little bit every year. When Ramadan falls in January... They don't have to fast so long. They eat breakfast before the sun rises. They can eat dinner after the sun sets. But in July and August, Ramadan falls in those months too. As it moves around the year following the lunar calendar, then they have to go a much longer time with nothing to eat. But they can drink. They can drink water. So they came. The, the Muslims came out of the same part of the world. So it doesn't mean Jesus went 40 days and nights without any water. We know persons can't live like that. They, they die. Um, but in the day times, in the day times without food, perhaps eating, I mean, even to go on a hunger strike for 40 days, would, you would not only be hungry, uh, you know, you'd be incapacitated. So this liar, tempter, came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, See, the Holy Spirit had told him that he was. You're my son, the beloved. Well, if you are, command these stones, and again, that part of Judea, now Israel, covered with little rocks everywhere. How would you like for all these little round rocks to become bread? But Jesus answered, and he uses Hebrew scriptures. It is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Elohim. Then the liar took him to the holy city, that would be Jerusalem, and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple. And you and I, uh, I mean, when I was a child and I would hear that, I would think about a steeple of the temple. And scholars say it's not what's intended here. 
the Temple Mount, those of you who saw it again just recently, um, remember that, of course, the temple hasn't been there since 70 uh, of the first century of this common era. Two mosques sit up there now. But on the Temple Mount, scholars usually believe the pinnacle was in the southeast corner where the wall is the steepest from the Temple Mount. That is, if you were to stand up on the very corner of the southeastern part of the wall and look straight down, that's the greatest distance. And that that's probably what was in mind here. It doesn't mean there was a steeple of any kind on top of the temple that was still there when Jesus was living. That's not the way they designed their temple. Steeples are Christian things, uh, not synagogue things as such, uh, or, or Jewish temple things. So it's probably where those huge stones came together and there was a great distance down. Uh, but here again, most scholars believe it doesn't mean that Jesus and the liar actually went up to Jerusalem, but this is happening in heart and mind. Uh, if you're the Son of God, you can throw yourself down from this great height. And here the liar quotes Scripture. It's written, he will commend his angels concerning you on their hands. They will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answers him from Scripture. Again, it is written, do not put Yahweh, your Elohim, to the test. So again, the liar took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. There is no mountain in Israel tall enough to see all of them. So this is again in his mind, in his heart. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, liar. It is written, worship me. Yahweh, your Elohim, and serve only him. And that is the Shema, of course, in Judaism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You must have no other God but him. Then the liar left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. Okay? Let's go a little bit farther. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. So the way the synoptics tell this, it, it came soon after the baptism of Jesus. Uh, these great crowds were coming down to the Jordan to be baptized by John, to hear him preach. They were fascinated by him. Uh, we don't know just how many were getting baptized. Matthew says lots of them. And suddenly John gets arrested. Now, the Gospels, if you read all four of them, you discover that what he's, the reason he's been arrested is that he finally, in one of his sermons, got really personal about the king. The king who ruled over the third portion, the south portion of the kingdom, once ruled over entirely by Herod the Great, has taken his brother's wife with her consent. I mean, she has left one brother and come and married the other brother. Uh, and John the baptizer says, oh, that ain't fitting. That is not right. Uh, divorce is not right. It's not right for the royal family. And uh, even if you put a woman aside, it was a man's world back in those days, to take your brother's wife is incest. It's incestuous in Judaism. You're just not supposed to do that. Now, I've told you it seems to be fine in everything from country western mu music and back again. When Kenny Rogers, uh, one of his biggest hits back there years ago, uh, he sang that he uh, had an encounter with this woman and uh, when it was all over, she said, but you'll never be the man your father was before you. People bought records, you know, by the hundreds of thousands. It's okay for Kenny and his dad to sleep with the same woman or whoever wrote the song. I know it was just a song for him, but somebody thought it was all right, and he sang it as if it was all right. Same guy, uh, to, I mean, same woman, uh, father and son. 
John the baptizer would have had no part of that. Uh, no, no, no part of that. So that seems to have been the reason why he was arrested and put in the dungeon there at the uh, fortress of Machaerus, scholars believe. Well, Jesus leaves. You know, uh, he hasn't done what God has sent him to do. There's a chance, you see, that if he's being identified in any way with John the Baptizer, he could end up in prison as well. Uh, he has much to do before his time comes, and so he goes back up to Galilee, roughly 90 miles north. He left Nazareth. Here Matthew mentions it, his hometown, and made his home in Capernaum by the sea. All of those of you who've been there, we always take you to Capernaum. It sits right on the coast of the uh, Sea of Galilee, right about where the twelve would be if it were the face of the clock, right up at the top. Um, there were, at one time, ten little towns there. They were called the Decapolis, in Greek, Deca. We have in Decade, ten polis, towns, Decapolis, are mentioned in the Gospels, but one after the other, these little towns died or were destroyed and were covered over by the blowing dust. That happened to Capernaum as well. Some years ago now, the Roman Catholics had opportunity to buy that spot. I mean, the church, the church of Roman Catholicism bought it and started doing excavations. And what's happened since then, uh, we can be grateful uh, to the Roman Catholics for making that happen. But you certainly can see the ruins of Capernaum today, including the synagogue there uh, that, that, that was at Capernaum. Okay, he made his home in Capernaum by the sea. And again, in the Bible they call it a sea. You and I know that it's always been a freshwater lake. It's uh, made by the beautiful spring waters uh, that crop up in several different places immediately north, Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus was identified by Peter as the Messiah, is one of those places. This time we went to another place uh, up at Dan, D-A-N, uh, and saw another big outpouring of the same water that makes its way into the Sea of Galilee. Okay. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, and that means... For Jewish readers, and Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience, uh, they would know where that was. And it, they were two of the twelve tribes, and where those two tribes first settled um, is, is where they're talking about, what was called Galilee in the New Testament. So that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, and here he's looking again for references. Can he find anything in the Hebrew Scriptures to support what Jesus is doing? And there he finds it. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea. And over and over last, uh, two months ago, uh, Pilar, more than I remember other guides doing it, kept talking about the Via Mari, the Via Mari she kept talking about. The name of the Romans, the way of the sea, or the road by the sea. Uh, I've known all this time that the, the more level paths were either down the Jordan River or by the Mediterranean, of course. And then you have this little spine of hills that run, run, that run right down through the middle of the country. So it's definitely easier to go along the coast or to go along the river. So this time uh, the quotation is, On the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. So he sees Jesus returning to Galilee and taking up residence as Capernaum as fulfilling that scripture. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, and look what the message is. It's exactly the message of John the Baptizer. See that? If you go back and look, right there, chapter 3, verse 2, exactly the same as you have here in uh, chapter 4, verse 17. Turn or return, the kingdom of heaven has come near. All right, we're going to have to stop there. Uh, we'll stop Palm Sunday next Sunday. It'll be April 17, and we'll begin at chapter 4, verse 18. If you haven't been to church yet, be sure to stay and help us. I'll be right back.